Hello, my beautiful friends. My name is Kim, and I hope you're having a fabulous day today. If you are interested in true crime like I am, I hope that you would consider hitting that subscribe button. But either way, thanks for being here. Just a little announcement. I have a new channel where I talk about how cuckoo I am, and it's a nice community that we have over there discussing topics like mental health, addiction, that kind of thing. So if you would like to check it out, I will have it linked below. Today we're going to be talking about Zara Baker. Zara was only 10 years old when tragedy hit her home and she had fought her whole young life to live, literally, not figuratively, like literally she fought to live. She was so young when she was betrayed and ignored by those meant to love her the most. This case has it all lies finger pointing neglect in the most disturbing actions of an evil stepmother that could ever exist let's talk about zara but first thanks to our sponsor harry's shaving feels so amazing when it's done right that is why i use harry's to get the job done on my sensitive and stubborn skin they have five blade razors with a flex hinge to really get a close shave. Their razors just glide across the skin, leaving soft, smooth skin behind. The handle is a textured and weighted, so you get full control of the razor. Their foaming gel complements the razor because it has aloe and hyaluronic acid in it, which is perfect if you have sensitive skin like I do. It just makes shaving more enjoyable and easy. Harry's delivers directly to your door, so it is convenient. Harry's is a fraction of the cost of most store-bought razors, and honestly, I think they are a thousand times better. Harry's has a starter kit that comes with the five blade razor, weighted handle, a travel cover for the razor in a foam shave gel. Perfect kit to get a perfect shave. Harry's 100% money back guarantee if you are not happy with your order, which I think you will be, but this is just Harry's standing behind their product, which I find is amazing. You can get the starter kit right now with my code, which I will display on the screen and also have down in the description box. This is a steal for the products that you get in this kit. Thanks to Harry's for making today's video possible and thanks to you guys for listening. Now for today's case. On October 9, 2010 at 5.30 a.m., Alyssa Baker called the Catawaba County 911 dispatcher and said there was a fire in the backyard at her house on 21st Street in Hickory, North Carolina. She said she didn't know how the fire had started, but she was afraid it was going to spread to the house if not extinguished, if they didn't come right away. So the fire truck and the police cruiser arrived and the fire is quickly put out. While they are looking around, a police officer finds a ransom some note on her husband's truck, Adam Baker. Alyssa's husband had driven his boss's work truck home that night before, and the note was found in the window of the boss's truck. The note was addressed to Mark David Coffey, and it said in part, Mr. Coffey, you like being in control. Who is in control now? We have your daughter and your Pot-smoking redhead son is next unless you do what we ask. One million unmarked will be in touch soon. Also, no cops. <laughs> and it was underlined twice. Now, Adam and Alyssa did not have a son. They only had a daughter named Zara, but Adam's boss, Mark, had a son and a daughter, so the police very quickly went to the Coffee household and were able to verify that both Coffee children were safe. It was determined that the note was left at the Bakers mistakenly, and maybe the kidnapping hadn't gone through. With the fire put out and making sure that the Coffee children were safe, the police and the fire officials left. Later that same day, at 2 p.m., Adam Baker calls to 911 to say his own daughter, Zara, is missing. 
It's Hava County 911. Hey, how you doing? I'm good. I need police. Secret Police 911, where's your emergency? Uh, yeah, my daughter is missing. I'm sorry? Your my daughter, daughter is missing? Yes, yes. Okay, what's your address? 21 21st Avenue, Northwest. The police were out here last night. Um, they were firing a ransom note for my boss's daughter. Um, I got up this a little while ago, and it appears they took my daughter instead of my boss's daughter. Okay, how old's your daughter? She's 10. Um, she's handicapped, she has a prosthetic leg, so that... How long has she been missing? Um, we checked in there last night about 2.30 and she was there and all this happened last night about 5 o'clock so I don't know if they set a fire in the yard to distract us to go out and wouldn't they snug in the door or I don't know. Okay, I'm not familiar with what happened last night. What happened last okay. night? Last night we were woken up, my dog woke me up and I had a fire in the backyard and somebody had put gas in my company vehicle that I drive for work. They left a ransom note on the company vehicle to my boss saying they had his daughter and his son was next. Um, and his daughter's fine. His daughter came with him here last night when I called him. And uh, it appears they may have taken my daughter instead of his daughter. Speaking to the police department, he explains that he thinks the fire that morning was meant to distract them. So whomever could, um, so when they're outside, whomever could go in and take their 10-year-old daughter, Zara. He also says he thinks she was taken mistakenly with the point of the kidnapping actually being Mr. Coffee's kids. So the police come out and a search is started for Zara and it would last for weeks and would end in finding her body. The police would find that this had nothing to do with another man's kids. The kidnapping note was a fake and Zara had been dead for weeks before she went missing or at least before she was reported missing. How did we get here? 
very interesting so far. When I read this much, I'm like, what? It's what? Like, how does this all tie together? It is the most bizarre story. So Zara Claire Baker was born on November 16, 1999 in Wagga Wagga, North South Wales, Australia to her mother, Emily Dietrich and her dad, Adam Baker. Unfortunately, Emily had severe postpartum depression that she was afraid to be alone with baby Zara. Shortly after Zara's birth, she gave full custody over to Adam, who she'd once been engaged to, and she felt more comfortable. She would say, quote, I didn't want to be that news story w- where people hear about the mother who drowns her child or couldn't stop them from crying or smothered them. I didn't want to be that mother. I didn't do it because I didn't love her. I did it because I did. We all know postpartum can be very difficult. And for any of you out there suffering, please reach out and get help. See a doctor. So it was very brave of her to know that she wasn't in a good place to take care of Zara. And so she found it to be more safe with Adam at the time. When Zara was five years old, Adam, along with his parents, moved to Queensland, also in Australia, to work for a sugar mill. The next year, in 2005, six-year-old Zara was diagnosed with bone cancer. Having cancer is incredibly hard on all kids, but bone cancer is one of the most painful. Because of this, Zara had to have an above-knee amputation of her left leg but she got a prosthetic leg and was running around in no time kids are so resilient but then she got lung cancer and so that's when I say she fought to live this girl fought I mean having bone cancer and then lung cancer like wow It puts it in perspective for all of us, let me tell you. But anyways, she got lung cancer and had to have part of her lung removed. During this, she was on very strong chemotherapy, which caused her to lose a large portion of her hearing, as if this kid hasn't had enough. So um, they got her hearing aids. This is her back in May, receiving hearing aids from a local charity. It sounds better than without them, so I can actually hear more than without my hearing aid. I have to stop and just say, this little girl has been through it. I mean, damn, this is a lot for an adult to handle, let alone a defenseless child. But it seems Zara was very strong that she was determined to carry on. Now, Adam, even though he was working and raising Zara, he was lonely for companionship. He signed up for an online site called Imvu, which is a website with a community where you can meet other people. And Adam did meet someone. He met a woman named Alyssa Fairchild, who went by Gothic Fairy on the website. Alyssa told him tales of how she'd been a police officer and how she had been shot in the line of duty while living and working in North Carolina in the United States because he's still living in Australia. She led Adam to believe she'd never been married before. After talking for a while, Adam flew Alyssa over to Australia so they could meet. Alyssa and Zara, they got along really well, which definitely gave Adam hope for the future. He said he was hoping to find someone to spend his life with, maybe give Zara a sibling. Adam's parents weren't crazy about Alyssa, but their main problem was that she lived in the U.S. Apparently in Australia, all of Zara's medical treatments, the chemotherapy, and all the necessary follow-up appointments recovered. And we know how healthcare is in the U.S. It's very expensive and very far and few between. So free healthcare, 
with her situation, I could get their concern in why they wanted her to stay in Australia. They were worried how Adam would be able to care for Zara in the States. But Alyssa told Adam, this was no problem at all. You do not need to worry about that because she had plenty of money. She had a savings and she would be happy to help pay for Zara's medical and, you know, any other bills to get him started. So Adam and Alyssa were married in Queensland, and Zara's cancer at the same time around 2008 went into remission just before moving to the States. It was, it was perfect timing, actually. Before we talk about the Bakers' life together, who was Alyssa really? Who she portrayed was not who Alyssa was. Alyssa Annette Fairchild was born in Western North Carolina in 1968 and lived with her two sisters and parents who worked in a textile factory. She was the middle child. By multiple interviews with friends and family, she was described as manipulative, cunning, and a compulsive liar. People also said she was pretty growing up and had a lot of boyfriends, many of them who overlapped. This specifically continues through her entire life. Now, she told Adam she'd never been married before, but in reality, she had been married six times. Six times, you guys, before she met him. All six of the husbands were interviewed, and I reviewed what all of them had to say, and they were kind of similar. They all gave eerily similar stories about what she was like, what they were like, and their relationships. Almost all of them were broken in some way. One had been deaf for most of his life. So he had problems communicating. One had a bone disease, which caused him to have a steel rod in his leg. One man had a limp from an injury. And it, and it was just so on and so on. Each said the relationship developed quickly. They dated for a very short time and were married within weeks of knowing each other. Each of these men she chose wanted to be responsible, good members of society. More importantly, they wanted to be a good father to Emily's children. That's right, I, I haven't told you that yet, but Alyssa had three children between the ages of 17 and 20. So these were older children, but nonetheless, she had children. She had three children with two different men. Not that that's a big deal, but just so you know. Now, after she split up with the last dad, she got custody of two of the kids. So she's dragging them from one marriage to the next. Then they would say that she started treating her kids really bad. She would smack them, hit them, lock them in their rooms for hours on end. When asked why, she said she didn't want to deal with them. A lot of the fights between Alyssa and these husbands was because how she treated her own children. Then every man said that at some point they would come home from work or bowling or visiting their mom and the house would be completely empty. And I do mean empty. She would literally clean out the house, taking everything, even if it belonged to the men, even if they've had it way before they even knew her. It's going with her. She cleaned them out. She even took one of her husband's expensive hearing aids. You know she only did this out of spite to be mean and vicious. It's not like she could use it or even pawn it. Now, the last marriage was to Aaron Young, the man who had previously had rickets, which is a bone disease that can cause deformities in limbs. He'd had an operation on one leg and had a steel rod in the other. Each man met her while she was married to the last man, and Aaron was no different. He was picking up the pieces of her broken heart from her last marriage when she met him or he met her. He says that while they were married, she discovered the internet and then she completely changed. She got tattoos, changed her hair, was 
online all night, and he would say that she started treating the kids terribly. From his point of view, they were trying to work it out. Like he knew there was problems, but he thought that they were just working through them. They were trying to like fix it and fix their marriage. But Alyssa, well, she was already talking to Adam Baker online, and then she was caught by Aaron's mom kissing another guy in her car, so the relationship, you know, ended, obviously. And so after this relationship ended, this is her sixth marriage uh, that's uh, clearly failed. Shortly after this, Alyssa told people she was moving to Australia. Remember, she's a compulsive liar, so not many people actually believed her. For Alyssa, moving to Australia probably sounded good considering by this time she went to visit Adam and she had a bunch of eviction notices, small claims court ju judgments, and liens against her from landlords, utilities, and other collectors. And, oh, one more thing, when Alyssa goes to Australia and marries Adam, she's still married to Aaron. Not only does she have a habit of overlapping relationships, which people do, that's not illegal, you know, kind of crappy, but people do it. She had a habit of overlapping her marriages, which in case you didn't know, it's illegal. It's called bigamy. <laughs> When it comes to Aaron, though, something weird happens because she kept him in her life even after she marries Adam, and the three move back to Hickory. So the three meaning Alyssa, Adam, and Zara. So they move back to Hickory, and they're around Aaron. She actually introduces Aaron to Adam, her seventh husband, as her brother, Aaron, her ex-husband, or maybe they're still married, I don't know, but she, this Aaron guy just goes along with it and says that he's her brother and her ex-husband's meeting her new husband, Adam. When, when asked by a reporter why she would do that, she said that Aaron wanted to keep being around Zara. Aaron, her ex-husband, wanted to be around Zara, her new husband's daughter, and she knew Adam would never allow it any other way. That has got to be the strangest non-answer I've ever heard. Your ex-husband wants to be friends, stay in contact with your new husband's 10-year-old daughter? Freaking creepy. No, 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 no. That's, and again, she's a compulsive liar. She probably just you know, off the cuff answered and it's the dumbest reason ever. But anyways, when Adam, Alyssa and Zara first moved to the United States, they stayed with her dad. You have to wonder what Adam thought at this point or what Alyssa told him, because remember, she's supposed to have money and a savings. So why couldn't they afford their own place? This didn't last long and her dad quickly kicked them out. No one is sure why, but Alyssa's relatives and her ex-husbands bet it's because Alyssa's substance abuse issues. In September, they moved into an apartment. I think by this point, Adam was just so deep into it and he was caught up in it all. You know, he was promised one thing and then he's now stepped into this. He's already moved. He's probably already sold his apartment wherever he was at before. And before you know it, here we are. And he's like, Ugh. you know, he's just following through with it, even though it wasn't what he originally signed up for. I think we've all been there and it's not fun. But anyways, so they are in the new apartment and the landlady, Shirley Mims, lives next door. So their landlord's right next door. She said she saw how dysfunctional the family was. And in fact, she never saw Zara. Shirley thought she was staying with her grandpa. I'm assuming she meant Alyssa's dad, but that was not the case. Zara was there, just never seen. They were also kicked out of that apartment so they moved into a mobile home park. This didn't last long, though, because Alyssa got a bad reputation around the other parents living near them. 
One of their neighbors, Tanya Hefner, who lived next door, seemed to see and hear the most. She said everyone in the park knew who Zara was and that she had cancer, which is why she had a prosthetic leg. She said Zara was incredibly sweet, who was being treated horribly by her stepmother. She had been seen hitting her. Actually, the words Tanya used was beating her for no reason at all. Also, Alyssa was heard outside of the trailer yelling at Zara to move faster, telling her that she could walk fine and she was faking it, and then teasing her about her leg and using a prosthetic. What kind of evilness is that? And this isn't a baby. Like, this is a impressionable age not saying it's appropriate when they're babies but I'm saying she's nine ten years eight nine ten years old like that's traumatic that's like self-esteem out the window talk it's it's just sad remember she was outside doing this so how bad was it inside the house when no one could see or hear and where was Adam you ask well Adam had a hard time finding a good job because he wasn't a U.S. citizen, so he took jobs that paid cash or under the table. He worked all the time, and he worked a lot of night and overnight shifts because he had to take what he could get, what was available. I'm not giving him an out. I 100% promise you that I am not giving him an out. I'm just giving you the facts and explaining what the situation was like at the time. You'll find that it's going to be very hard to give this man an out. Now, we should talk about the major failure on the part of Department of Social Services in both Catawaba and Caldwell counties because the bad treatment of Zara didn't happen in a bubble. You hear about the neighbor, Well, she saw something and she said something more than once. After Zara's death, both counties that they had lived in had to release a report on their interactions with the family. So I'll tell you what they said. On January 29, 2010, Caldwell County Social Services got a CPS report about Zara, and there was that was the first contact with the family. The report to them included allegations of improper discipline, improper care, and jurious environment. My guess, though, was we can't be sure is that it was from the neighbor. DSS said they initially did the assessment at the family's residence on February 1st, and this included interviews with the dad, stepmom, and child. Before they had done anything further, they received another call on February 4th. This CPS report had the same exact allegations in it. Here I think again, It's probably the neighbor. I bet she saw them come out, talk to Alyssa after, and who probably just bragged about they'd done nothing, so she called again. It's what I would have done. So now DSS makes a home visit with the family on February 4th to discuss the additional information received, basically to tell them they'd gotten a second call. They interviewed the dad, stepmom, child, and the neighbor friend and a friend of the family on this day. During this course of assessment, the department got an additional statement from a family member confirming what the dad, stepmom, and child said. Wait, what? You asked a family member and took them at their word. Just great. Then they put in their little report that the family assessment for both of the calls reports was completed and the case was closed on February 23rd with no evidence of maltreatment or child safety issues. Next, on May 28th, again, DSS gets a CPS report about Zara alleging improper discipline and improper care. They did the assessment in the family home, and on May 28th, including joint interviews with the step stepmom and the child, as well as separate interviews. So first, they talked to Zara with Alyssa, so Alyssa could make sure that it was clear on what Zara is supposed to say. Perfect, of course. I just don't understand how they do this and how it makes sense. 
I'm not in this situation. I don't know how it went down, but I'm just, I just don't understand. <laughs> but anyways, perfect. That's how it happened. And anyway, I'll move on. Dad wasn't home, and so they couldn't interview him until June 21st. They also got a statement from a family member and two additional individuals. The assessment was completed, and the case was closed June 23rd with, you guessed it, no evidence of maltreatment or safety issues. Caldwell County only gets one more call uh, before the major incident occurs. And there's one more call after this, but this is the last call, and this is on July 12th. Again, it's a CPS report with the exact same allegations. However, Caldwell County couldn't reach the Bakers because they had moved to the house on 21st Street, which was in Catawaba County. I don't even know if I'm saying Catawaba right, but... <laughs> Probably not. I'll put it on the screen. Anyways. So they reached out to uh, DSS and told the Caddo. <laughs> I feel like I'm saying it so wrong. So they reached out to Catawaba County DSS and they told them about the report and transferred the case on July 13th. However, nowhere in the report does it say that they made that Catawaba <laughs> made them aware of the previous times they'd been warned Zara was being hurt. So they only knew about the one allegation. They didn't know about the two other. The same day, an unannounced visit was made to this 21st Street home. The dad, stepmom, and Zara were all interviewed separately. Way to go. Then on July 22nd and August 5th, they visited again. They were very thorough. They wanted to make sure they had all their ducks in a row, but they didn't know about the other cases. And additionally, I have more information, but let me get there. They got statements from people who may have knowledge of the situation. The assessment was completed and the case was closed because they found no evidence of maltreatment or safety issues. <sighs> the last time... DSS was contacted. Was It was too late. It was on October 9th when the police were calling looking for records because Zara was missing and feared dead. So a couple of things. First, the two other individuals I'm assuming were Alyssa's grown children that may have been around, so they were interviewed. Secondly, they got interviews from people who had knowledge. Well, I'm going to assume the list came from Alyssa. Third, Zara went to school, so why didn't they interview her teacher? We know they don't because one of these calls was actually from her teacher. She said that she could tell Zara wasn't being taken care of, and the longer she had her in her class, she started seeing signs of abuse. She saw bruises, scratches, Zara's hair was falling out, and every time Alyssa had to come up to the school to talk about these things, Alyssa would fly off the handle. She was just angry. She's wasting her time. Why do I have to be here? Stop making stuff up. She never tried to fix the situation. She just basically grabbed her stepdaughter and left. So the teacher, as a mandated reporter, called CPS or DSS. When nothing changed, she went to, she went a step further and actually gave Zara her phone number, telling her she could call any time she was in danger. She is my hero. She tried so hard to save Zara. Like, I deeply think she generally tried to help her. She said she didn't know what else to do. She was scared for Zara. Well, Alyssa found out about this phone number exchange. To give her her own personal cell number and say to her, if you ever need me, call me. That right there was out of protocol. I even said something to the principal about that, me and Adam went, because that was against the rules. They should not have ever done that. In the very next day, she pulled Zara out of school and started Get, you guessed it, homeschooling her. People with open CPS reports, have had CPS reports, should not be allowed to homeschool. I've said it once. I have people who disagree with me. I don't care. Isolate and hide. 
that's what these parents do, and they call it homeschooling. There's no schooling going on. It's beatings. It should be a privilege. I'll get off my soapbox now, sorry. That didn't stop this teacher, though. She actually stopped by the house, and she just wanted to check on Zara. I'm surprised Alyssa let her in, but she actually did. Zara had a black eye. She told the teacher she fell and hit it on a coffee table. This is also what she told her dad when he asked apparently, allegedly. So on October 9th, after Zara is reported missing, the police come out to the house and take a report. Then they start a massive search. Remember, Adam had told the police that he had the fire in the backyard and he thought it was a DV so that when he and Alyssa were out of the house, that they could come in and grab Zara. Frankly, I don't like to call out police often, but I've never been able to understand why they didn't visibly verify that Zara was okay that night. They said they took a girl. They have a daughter. Wouldn't their first reaction be to go and see if she's okay because there was a mix-up? But they don't. And I think this is where their plan got fouled up. I mean, there's a fire in the backyard that was clearly set. Then they find a ransom note on his boss's work truck that Adam had driven home. Granted, the ransom note was addressed to his boss. And it did reference his boss's kids. But it was left on the vehicle in their driveway. If it had been me, I would have insisted on seeing little Zara and making sure she was okay. However... It wouldn't have saved her anyways. Y yeah, it, it's a matter of hours, but it's just, it's just one of those things where it's like, why didn't they see her? But anyways, however, it wouldn't have saved her because she had already been dead for a while by this time. But on that day, they actually arrest Alyssa on unrelated charges. I'm not sure if they suspected something and already had evidence, so they brought her in as a bargaining chip. The original charge that day was for theft, for writing bad checks. After all of this, she also was charged with identity theft for setting up utilities in her daughter's name and one of those places that she lived in. And then she was charged with 20 different narcotic charges. So it could have been either, but it doesn't matter. While she was being questioned, she agreed to take a polygraph. And I'm not surprised that she agreed to this. If she is that good of a liar as she thinks she is, she might have thought she would have passed. She'd be wrong. They questioned her. Three questions were asked specifically about Zara. One, did you hurt Zara? Two, do you know if anyone has done harm to Zara? Three, do you know the person who wrote the ransom note? The results were she was being deceptive. Now, Adam originally said he'd also seen Zara that morning around 2.30 a.m. when he came home from work. Alyssa said he checked, she checked on her around 2 a.m. But during questioning, Adam says he actually hadn't seen her since the 6th, so that would have been three days ago. He says Alyssa told him she checked on her around 2. It would come out much later that Adam couldn't verify seeing her for the last two weeks. He said he was struggling with sobriety, so he was leaving much of the care of Zara to Alyssa, whom he always thought loved Zara very much. How, how, how did he think that? In fact, he'd barely seen her at all in the last five months. I have very strong opinions on this, but I'll save them until the end of the story. So meantime, while they are searching, they go door to door in the Baker's neighborhood trying to find out when she was last seen. They are trying to get a fixed external verification source for Zara's last alive date. 
Because they don't trust either dad or mom at this point at all. None of the neighbors had seen her, but they eventually talked to a worker at a furniture store in Hickory who saw Zara in the store with Alyssa on September 22nd of 2010. So their last verifiable date was about two weeks earlier. On October 10th, they brought a pair of search and rescue dogs out to search the house and the area. Both dogs hit on a scent of decomp. So these smells that linger from a dead body, and yes, they can tell the difference between an animal and a human. They found this scent in the house and in both vehicles, Alyssa's car and Adam's truck. Now the reports list it as a Chevy Tahoe, but none were clear on if it was the boss's truck or his personal truck. The police also found what they thought was blood in the Tahoe, so they took a sample of it to the lab. They continued the search, and they were even able to put out an amber alert. I know that I asked how and with what at the beginning of this, some states have different color alerts to use for this, but they were able to put her info out because she had disabilities. Remember, they were looking for a mostly deaf little girl with a prosthetic leg and only a half a lung. Now, they did not have vehicle information, but they put out the report out anyway. In some states, they have different color alerts, silver and blue for children with disabilities and elderly people if they go missing. They searched all day but found nothing. On October 11th, Alyssa admits in yet another interview that she was the one who wrote the fake ransom note. She said she did it to get back at Adam's boss, who was also their landlord, because she was angry at him. Between Adam's changing story, Alyssa's admission about the ransom note and the findings that of the search dogs, which wouldn't stand alone, they got a search warrant for the house, and then over the next couple days, they got many more search warrants. One thing they found with the search warrant was that DSS in multiple counties had been called to report Alyssa for hurting her own children going all the way back to 1999. Why didn't either of these counties find that? I, I, I'm, I'm asking the question in a facetious way, but I'm actually generally interested. Like, how did they not find out that this woman has had CPS called on her since 1999? Was it the last name? Was it I don't know. They actually were in a position to save Zara. On October 26, Search found Zara's prosthetic leg in a field of trash on Charlie Road in Caldwell County. They said that they knew for sure that little Zara was dead. They had been talking to Alyssa in jail. Yes, she was being held on a very high bail because her own daughter testified that the day before her arrest, she had been talking about leaving town like getting the heck out of there. She also testified that her mom had an online boyfriend in England who sent her thousands of dollars of cash. So on the same day they found Zara's leg, they reached out to Alyssa's lawyer and she agreed to take the police to Zara's body. First, she tells them that on September 24, she had run out for a few minutes to get a few errands done. And when she got back home, Zara was just mysteriously dead. She said that Zara had been sick for two weeks before that, although there is no evidence of that. Alyssa says that she tried to do CPR for 30 minutes, but it didn't work, and instead of calling 911, she called Adam. When he got home from work, she said he told her he'd take care of things, took her in the bathroom, uh, 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 Zara took Zara in the bathroom, and dismembered her. Then together, on the next day, the 25th, they had each taken white trash bags with parts of Zara in them and left the bags in dumpsters and some buried 
just basically all over town. While her lawyer goes along, Alyssa takes the police to several places around town to show them where they had dumped her. They went to many dumpsters. Of course, they'd all been dumped by now. The police did later find some of the cleanup items at the landfill. As for parts of Zara, they found many of them. Some were in areas with other trash. Some were buried or half buried. But they did not find them all. They did not find her skull until 2012. The reason Alyssa decided to take them to Zara's body is because that was the difference between first degree and second degree murder charges. She was already looking for a deal. As for Adam, she insisted that he had helped her dispose of those trash bags. She said that they were in constant communication, him calling her to check on how things were going, but Adam denied having any part in Zara's death or what happened after, and according to his cell phone data, he was at work all that day while Alyssa called him a few times and he never once called her. And Alyssa's phone did ping at all of these places where the police were taken to. So Adam's phone is tracked at work all day and her phone is tracked at all of these dumping sites. Zara's cause of death was listed as undetermined violent homicide, and the medical examiner said it was likely she was already dead when the dismemberment happened. When she was originally charged, they did not have the skull and was hoping it might show the cause of death, but even when it was found, it did not prove much else. Adam was charged with identity theft and obtaining property under false pretenses because he supposedly used Alyssa's daughter's husband's name and social security number because Alyssa has a 20-year-old daughter. She, he used her husband's identity and social security number to get power connected to their apartment that they lived in. Alyssa, you remember, was charged with this also for using her daughter's name to get phone service and utilities on one of the places they lived in. Alyssa was indicted on seven counts of possessing, distributing, and conspiring to distribute narcotics. Alyssa pled guilty to second-degree murder, obstruction of justice, and bigamy because of the aggravating factors which were Alyssa in a position of trust and she had a history of hurting Zara. She desecrated her body to obstruct justice. She hid Zara away. After all, she was young and handicapped. She got 18 and a half years for this. She dismembered her. And it, but anyways, 18 and a half years. She pled guilty to the drug charges and got an additional 10 years. So that's comforting to know that she's going to get 28 and a half years. The drug charge is a federal, and so it has no option of parole. So after she serves her 18 and a half, then she will be moved to federal prison to do her additional 10. She is currently housed in solitary because she is supposedly the most hated woman in the North Carolina prison. I understand why. Adam was able to plead down to a misdemeanor, reconnecting electricity falsely and paid a fine. The investigators came out and said they do not believe he was involved in Zara's murder or dismemberment. He was eventually allowed to return to Australia to bury little Zara. This is my opinion. Okay, take it or leave it. And I have strong opinions. And I don't say this lightly because I never want to re-victimize a victim. I just want to put that out there right now. If, if I wasn't so convinced, I wouldn't even say it. But I am, I am so confident. But anyways, he has cell phone records. The dad, Adam, has cell phone records to prove he was at work. And only Alyssa's phone had GPS in the places that Zara's, or Zara's body was dumped. But she had been missing for some time before she was noticed to be missing. Again, my opinion, but dismembering a body is not easy. It's messy and it's labor intensive. Did he not notice bloody towels to clean up? Did he not notice the blood spatter in the room? Did he not notice 
that she wasn't there for two weeks or at minimum immediately after the fire was started and that would have been the first thing I would have done is check on the kids. On top of that, I've covered cases where grown men have given up halfway through dismembering a body because it was so difficult. Could Alyssa have had the strength to have done this on her own and fast and cleaned up fast enough where he wouldn't notice? Alyssa was calling him on the day that she was disposing of parts, nine times in total. Why was she calling him so much while he was at work? They weren't talking about the weather, I can tell you that. He's at work, nine times? I think he knew more than he is letting on. That your wife was anyway involved in your daughter's disappearance? I'm not sure. I'd like to think no, but that's my wife. Until they've completed their investigation, you can tell me some more. I can't honestly say. Was he involved? I don't know. But I think he knew more than he's letting on. And people have spent the rest of their life in prison for just that very thing. He's spending zero time. Yes, I understand he was heavy into it an addiction. But still, Zara was homeschooled, so was always home. How do you not notice a person that's always there, let alone your own daughter, who is typically always present, is nowhere to be seen for weeks? It was just him and her for a long time before Alyssa even came into the picture. So she was his whole world. How do you go from that to just, I haven't seen her? in a while and didn't notice she was missing for weeks. Look, I am not here to re-victimize a victim. His loss is something that I just cannot imagine. And if he truly didn't notice, then my sincere apologies, but it is going to take a lot of convincing for me to believe that he knew, didn't know more than what he was letting on. But I would love to know your guys' thoughts. As for Alyssa, she will be out when she is 70, and I would bet she is going to find her eighth husband no problem. We live in a strange world. I watched a 60-minute episode on this case involving her, and man, is she all kinds of messed up. The interview asked her how she sleeps at night, and she just says, some nights it's hard. Some nights? Some nights, I couldn't breathe in parts of this story, and she gets a good night's sleep, evil to the core, and that is a fact. Let's leave a pink heart in the comments for 10-year-old Zara and her surviving family. Thanks to all my channel members and Patreons who continue to support me. Their names are on the screen. If you would like early access to new videos and decide the cases I cover next, you can do so by clicking the Join button from the desktop, or there is a video in the description box on how to do it from your phone. Well, if you guys have made it to the end, you guys are rock stars and I love you to death. There are more true crime videos in my Crimey Stories playlist for you to check out. Stay safe, my loves. And remember, if you see something, say something. And I'll see you in my next one. Bye. <laughs>